So I'd like to welcome you all to UB's School of Architecture and Planning this evening. And uh, on behalf of Dean Chibley and all of the faculty, uh, and really to thank the Confucius Institute at UB uh, for their support. And uh, Kristen Stapleton is here, the director of the and Dr. Yang is here. And, uh, Maybe not argue. So it's the best university in China. 
So then, um, this is a way of talking about a resourceful architect, if you have a connection. So then I, I want to tell you one other example. So, he saw an oncoming storm in New York City and realized that an early morning flight to Buffalo might be cancelled, would likely to be cancelled. So he found a car and he drove to Buffalo. So, Thank you so much. And uh, uh, I'm very honored to be here. And also, uh, I'd like to thank you all very much for being here, sitting here, to listen to my talk instead of going to the Halloween party. And uh, anyways, uh, hollow, happy Halloween. <laughs> and yes, uh, but I enjoy the trip, actually, uh, driving from New York to here. And I spent three days in New York to adjust my jet lag, which is important for me to keep my mind clear to give a talk. And also, uh, I try to keep my speak as clear as possible and as logical as possible and not uh, boring. Otherwise, you, you, you will <laughs> be suffering from the last, uh, next one hour. Uh, I would like to uh, speak a little bit about my, myself and why I'm here and what I'm going to talk about is not just about uh, China, uh, not just about my architecture, but also how I learn architecture and how I see what my architecture is supposed to be and uh, why I do architecture the way I do things. Yeah. And the, but the important thing I want to mention uh, first, uh, the way I do architecture is not a really typical way of practicing, uh, not in China, not anywhere else. It's, a, it's like uh, you cannot survive by doing architecture the way I do. So, uh, but there's a reason behind this. So I've explained little by little. And I did my first degree of architecture in Tsinghua, and then I went to study uh, in Netherlands, in Delft, for four years. I did my PhD there, and then I practiced a little bit, and then went to Singapore to teach in Singapore for some years. The reason I go to Singapore is because my mind is kind of a really messed up with the knowledge I learned from China, from Netherlands. And I feel really difficult for me to digest what is the architecture I'm looking for. So that's why I went to uh, Singapore. I tried to do research and put my minds together as, a, as one piece. And then uh, 2003, uh, okay, I thought I was, I was ready and China is ready for me. Because uh, before uh, 2003, China is like an uh, emerging economy and everything goes very fast. And uh, the society is not ready for really uh, creative thinking and for really uh, interesting ideas to happen in, the, in, the, in architecture practice. And the reason why 2003 is an important year is that by that year, uh, China is not to hold the Olympics uh, in Beijing. So it become a kind of opportunity for everyone to do project in China. Foreign architects, local architects, the collaboration between the, the both of them, and then it's like everybody talk about architecture. So it's like a watershed. And uh, that's the reason that I start doing my practice uh, in China. My first project starts in 2003. And that's also, after that, I went back to China. So uh, this is a short story about myself. And then uh, I will start, uh, the title of this uh, speech is about towards the reflexive regionalism. I will explain a little bit about this. Uh, before I talk about my own project and the issues I try to address in China, I want to give a little bit review of uh, two case studies. One is Singapore, one is Hong Kong. And uh, Singapore is, is a very unique case for me to put up my minds together, as I just mentioned. And the reason behind this is yeah, Singapore is a, is a young country. It's a, become independent since 1965. Uh, so, as a young country, and when Singapore become independent, they have a tremendous problem of identifying themselves as a un unified country. So they have to look for ideas and identities. So this is their solution. They put up a marine line. So this is a legend they created to identify every single point as a single point. And then uh, they invited international uh, architects from all over the world 
Uh, you can see Kensel Tanki's work, you can see Alan Pace's work from this image, and from also the uh, other European American architects. And, but somehow after a few years, practicing of this kind of uh, design, Singaporeans realized that the, uh, the foreign architects doing the design the same way as they do in their own country. So it has nothing to do with Singapore. So when you come by boat from Malaysia or Indonesia, you see the, these high-rise buildings floating over the tropical uh, region. It's like a, a mirage, mirage. So it doesn't belong there. And then uh, there's uh, the start to talk about this. Why? What, what is the identity? See, this doesn't look like Singapore at all. So what happened with... And then uh, there's a tremendous discussion about uh, what is the Singapore architecture supposed to be? And uh, by that time, there's, uh, there's interesting uh, debate, discussions about this, what I call post-colonial term. That is the uh, uh, tropical countries, uh, colonized countries after independence, they have to look for ways to claim to be independent, to find a way through architecture. So this is the, because architecture is the best way to, uh, to actually uh, physically present people, visually and physically, that here is our own country, here is the identity of our own country. And then, uh, interesting thing is the, uh, there's another discussion between center and periphery. So those countries become independent they want to be the center as well. But by then, there's tremendous uh, dis distinction between what is center, what is periphery. Center produce ideas because they, uh, they are advanced in economy, in ideas, in science, and technology, and, and the, the, whole, uh, the whole package. They provide ideas fundamentally. And the periphery try to uh, acquire the same stages of the development country of the center by copy the ideas of the centers. But by doing so, they lost their own voice. So when you lost your own voice, you never become centrist because you are always under the shadow of the center. And then uh, Kuhas probably is the first one who realized in architecture that you don't do, you don't follow the center. The idea is you do independent thinking. And then try to identify what's the problems of the periphery and try to find solutions based on your finding of the periphery. So this is the one who is designed in, uh, in Rotterdam. So for, for him, reality is dirty. So the architect's job is not to replace dirtiness and give a clean one, but rather to be responsive, to be reflexive about reality. And that is his design. You can see that the, uh, the eight columns, none of them is identical to another one. Because for him, reality is like this. And uh, so he tried to counterbalance the uh, design of the modern movement. And then Singaporeans realized this after discussion uh, starting from 1990s. They start to do design based on their understanding of the issues that they're supposed to address in Singapore. So the issue in Singapore is like this. So they don't have a history. They don't have a culture. So cultural issues, historical issues is not important. Then what is the issue in Singapore? Tropicality. So it's about nature, it's, a, it's about sun shading, it's about cross ventilation. So this is a, after they understand the problems. So you feel now, here we have a Singaporean architecture. And this is a design uh, by Woha, a very uh, emerging uh, creative design firm in Singapore. And this project won Aga Khan Award uh, th uh, five years ago, and just because the simple design of this window. Because in the tropics, you have the problem of cross ventilation. You have the problems of the uh, rains as well. So you want to get a cross ventilation at the same time when it's raining. So this is the solution. Just by simple design of a detail of the opening system. At same firm, so you can feel the tropicality in his design. So they are clear about what to do with the design now. And uh, this is another design by uh, SADA, another uh, young architecture firm in Singapore, where you can see that the, uh, the living room actually is totally open to the courtyard, which means the actually, I live in Singapore in, the, in an apartment which is about 11 floors high, and uh, the, the windows of the living room never closed for seven years. 
because you want to be part of nature in Singapore. And here, here's the, uh, the bedroom where you want to be comfortable with the uh, reasonable temperature. Then you have uh, the, uh, the sun shading, you have air conditioning, and so on and so forth. And this is not ex another example, a townhouse. And uh, this townhouse design turned the whole idea about designing townhouse upside down. So there's nothing much you can do with outside. Right? There's no view whatsoever. So what architects did in this project is to turn a green space inside. Porosity is important for lighting get through, and cross ventilation is important so that somehow you don't segregate different spaces. Rather, you mix up with the uh, with much larger uh, volume space to allow lights in and uh, air go across. So you don't need to have a roof for shower, even during the rain. Why bother to have a roof? And this is because you you open up to nature, right? Because open up to the issues of, of the tropicality. Another case I want to, uh, uh, to mention before the China part is Hong Kong. And in, in Hong Kong, it's different. It's, it, it's also tropical. But in Hong Kong, it's different issues. They don't have much land. So you don't have land. You create your own backyard. You don't have a, you know, the beach. You create your own beach. And so multifunctional uh, program uh, design is important for them. The, the average, uh, the, the use of resource comparing with Los Angeles, probably Hong Kong is the, uh, is the, uh, the smallest in terms of the average uh, uh, space you occupy. And so a friend of mine, uh, Gary Chang, a very talented uh, young architect, he uh, I will show few, two of his uh, works. One is the T set, and he identified clearly what's the, what's are the, what are the issues in Hong Kong. And that's the, the guy and uh, the grandfather of uh, Barry Chang. And he was uh, commissioned to design a T set for Philips. And uh, he got inspired firstly by the process of tea making. And then he identified this is Hong Kong. You know the dim sum making? So that you can, you can pile up. It's a high rise building, and it's a fast food. So the size of the stove like this can serve so many people in a restaurant very, very fastly. Yeah? You can pile up as high as you, as you want. So here's his design. Flexibility and small space. And then his, his apartment is like a, a tryout of uh, his ideas. And he tried, uh, he actually uh, uh, modi modified his apartment three times already. I don't think he's continued to do that, but uh, it's interesting to show that how he, uh, starting from, from 10 years ago, he started to change his apartments. That's 30 years ago, uh, is here. That's his apartment. He still lives there. He was born here and still living here. He's, he's 50 years old now. He's a very famous architect in Hong Kong, but he enjoyed this uh, the, the tiny apartment. And uh, here was before uh, his parents' room, his two older sisters' room, and that's his room, toilets, and uh, the kitchen. And uh, here is about four meters, this is about eight meters. So 320 square foot, right, roughly, right? So five people living in this apartment. And then some years ago, the whole apartment belongs to himself. All the family members moves out and still here. And he enjoyed it so much. I have the whole space. He designed the whole thing like a city. You know, I have square, I have uh, Streets, you can see from his design. But right away, he felt this is not the right way to do uh, this space. So it turned into this. So you cannot do two programs at the same time. That's what he found out. And then 
It can be the living room, can be the bedroom, or the showroom for a movie, whatsoever. It depends on the timing. So he somehow designed the space based on lighting system. This is how, the, how it goes. Eh? Let's show this so some combination. This is, a, this is the size, tiny, huh? So this is a, the bedroom, and then living room. Then there's only one window facing, uh, used to facing the sea view, and now there's no more sea view. Daytime, nighttime. And the, this is a few years ago, he changed again. And this time, the whole apartment is like a machine, it's like a transformer. <laughs> Here it is. He's very happy now. <laughs> and this little project, I, I think, has been published in more than uh, 30 languages all over the world. This is really popular. Every day he received, uh, he, he actually stayed there, but every day he has guests from all over the place. So the idea is the, when you understand the issues, you actually have the understanding of what is the problems and what is the solution supposed to be. So now we come to China. And China, of course, uh, comparing with Hong Kong, with Singapore, is a totally different scenario. And then you have to identify uh, very sophisticated and complicated issues when you come to design of an architecture. And so this is China when you're looking from afar in terms of time. Beautiful, with a really uh, interesting culture, uh, elements to, to, to study. And uh, this is China looking from afar in terms of distance. Uh, well, it's trying to, you know, you can tell that from this image, try very hard to present itself as the, as emerging star in terms of modern society. And this is reality. This is when you look at China from close distance. So we have leftover spaces. We have very negative elements during the process of fast rapid, uh, rapid urbanization process. This is reality. Uh, this is now turned into a school, actually. Before it's an apartment building, and before it was torn down, the highway is there. And uh, the image on the left is what we uh, do architecture, construction, before. And on the right is the reality. That's why we do architecture now. And this guy is a very famous Chinese, uh, Liang Qichao, who actually was the first Chinese who re realized China is simply another culture. I tried to give a brief review of the uh, of what happened for in China for the last see, uh, hundred years, and then I tried to come to, to come down, zoom down to the to the to the issues. And uh, he tried to reform when he come back to China. He was uh, studying in in Japan. So after studying in Japan, he looked back at China. So he has a reference point by comparative studies, and he looked at China differently. And uh, the second uh, period, important period in China is Mao's regime, where uh, he tried to lead China into a different uh, world. And in, within this world, there's a clear and uh, uh, strong defined ideology system behind what we do. And uh, based on this framework, uh, nothing much you can do because you have to serve uh, the principle of the socialist idea. So uh, aesthetics in general is forbidden. So landscape painting is forbidden in general unless you have uh, the magical color or some uh, celebration of uh, the socialist achievement. So Mao is actually uh, is like uh, the, at the bottleneck. So people understand, the Mao, understand China as Mao's China during the Cultural Revolution. He's the only poet, philosopher, and thinker. So after this uh, hustle and the bustle of uh, a craziness of cultural revolution, China become almost like old patient, exhausted of creative power. And 1980s, this is the first uh, page 
that we turn into a different uh, era. And uh, this painting actually uh, is like a landmark of what we've uh, been through, turning from a really, uh, uh, let's see, well, pretending, a uh, very pretending posture of, uh, of a society into a more free society. But in this case, uh, you can compare with the, the image I showed before. It's more like, a, uh, I don't want to pretend anymore. So this is reality. So no posture, no whatsoever. So in the beginning of the 1980s, there's a tremendous shift of coming back to reality. And the political issue is not clear. And so it's like TV, we have TV, but no program. <laughs> and we, everyone knows expecting the landscape is going to change, but don't know how. So I.M. Pei was invited to design something to show Chinese architects what's supposed to be contemporary Chinese architecture. And this is in 1979. And I.M. Pei was commissioned to design a hotel in Beijing. And he actually gave a proposal to the government of the frequent hotel design like this. And then the government was, uh, officials were very disappointed in the very beginning because they were expecting to pay to design something modern and Chinese. So Pei says, okay, uh, this is Chinese. You need to do Chinese first before you move to the modern. And uh, the government says, okay, maybe he's right. Because by that time, when we just opened the door, I was in school now, uh, by then. It's like uh, China is a black and white society, where outside China is like very colorful postmodern world already. And uh, so we need to set up confidence about ourselves first. So after that, after IMP's uh, project all over China, we practice like that. So we try to pick up what is the, uh, iconically, that's the title of my, my speech, iconic or what, right? Iconic means they, they try to uh, project what is the Chinese architecture based on the understandable uh, visual elements. And uh, this is the project I was involved as well. I, I supervised the construction of this project for two years in the mountain between 84 to 86. You can tell that this is the same way as what A.M. Pei did in his project. He's tried to uh, identify what is the original elements in, in iconic sense, and then design the new program. And it's almost like a mask of the original design. And this is another project by uh, another professor in, uh, in Tsinghua University. Uh, uh, this is the, 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 uh, coach, the new culture housing project in Beijing. So after uh, 20 years exercise on that, there's a problem now we are facing here. Architectural design become a matter of choice instead of a matter of debate. So either tradition or modern, east or west. So this is a very problematic. Is there a neutral way? So <laughs> uh, it's like this painting. It's like a mixed a fusion of different systems. So we just make up a choice. We need to do this, we need to do that, and then come together. That's why you can see that uh, in the 90s, we have a lot of fusion architecture like this. A box and then a fusion with the Chinese icon. And this is the top 10, the most ugly building <laughs> in China by the website from last year. And we keep doing this every year. So you understand now the situation now. So <laughs> there, I think there are more than five of, of, of this in China. Uh, OK, this is a hotel uh, in Beijing. Next time you go to Beijing, you probably can stay here. And uh, so you can, you can tell now what is the issue in China. We have a tremendous problem of um, what is the debate? What is supposed to, we supposed to do with our architecture? And, uh, and then uh, end of 1990s, be, before the, the turn of the 20th century, 21st century, 
those young uh, architects trained overseas start coming back to China. And they, when they look at reality, when they look at history, they decided we don't want to do anything with Chinese architecture. We just want to do universal, global, you know, international architecture. So this is the example from uh, uh, French trained uh, architects uh, who came back to China in 90, 1995. And it's like a, uh, he tried to play with form, with color, in abstract terms. It's like a collection of images and uh, we can, we can categorize this kind of de design as like an overstatement. Yeah, you don't need this, right? You don't need this. This is the city hall of uh, Shenzhen. So that's why, you know, when, when Ram Kuhas came to China to do the competition for CCT building, he recognized right away what China needs. is something big, something strange. Something you know, they need confidence. They need building to consolidate their their beliefs of their own culture. So Kuhas can give you more. But you know, this building costs twice as much as a normal building if you do the building normally. But this is a uh, compared with Halifa Tower in uh, in Dubai, the twice the same square meters, but the twice the price because you have to use 50 percent of the budget goes to the basement to structurally. And make the buildings stay. Okay, so uh, this is the period uh, where Chinese architects start to collaborate with foreign architects, through which they learn uh, the really the modern language, how to design modern building. So actually, before the turn of 20th century, we don't even have the uh, the process of urbanization, no industrialization. There's no uh, enlightenment movement, so we just turn overnight from Asian people to modern people. So psychologically, we were not ready, actually. And so uh, this is a design by local firm. Uh, okay, you can tell that this is modern, but if you look carefully, this building can be anywhere in the world. It can be here in Buffalo or Berlin or anywhere. So still, we don't have an issue, right? And this is a, uh, the problem that I, I look at. And I try to f identify some uh, issues that I can address to research and to understand modern architecture in China, Chinese practice a little bit differently from the way we practice now. And uh, this is a painting by uh, one of my favorite artists, Wu Guanzhong. Uh, it's modern, it's Chinese in a way. So that's also the kind of uh, uh, idea I try to look in my architecture. So this is my first uh, exercise when I went back to China in 2000, 2003. A small school, school project in Yunnan province. This is uh, the site, the village. And this is the resource I have. I have only about 60,000 US dollars to design and construct a school of 8,000 8, square foot. Here is the site. And I have a neighbor, important neighbor, Joseph Rocks, who worked for National Geographic in the 1920s. And he stayed in this house for 20 years. And so I have an important neighbor in a remote village in uh, Lijiang in the Yunnan province. And uh, the resource I have is the, this local materials and local resource, including material, and know-how, labors, and, and so on and so forth. I have to do a modern building to be responsive to all those conditions. So what I did is the, uh, I tried to figure out a way of uh, emerging uh, form, the form emerged from uh, the understanding of the local condition instead of, of local form. Instead of doing things like uh, they had, the Chinese architect has been doing for the last 30 years of uh, doing a form based on understanding of local form. So I do a different way. But because the limits of the resource I have, the way of construction, what I have to refer to 
how local people can understand because this building is totally constructed by local people. So the form is very simple, very straightforward. This program is just a school and a community center. So the way of doing construction, I have to find a different way because the, uh, this is the earthquake uh, pro area. So the building has to be earthquake resistance. So this is a new for them, the steel bars. So by doing the construction, the local people have to learn a new way of doing construction that can be earthquake resistant. And this is a difficult part uh, because of the, uh, one of the, uh, uh, my friend in the village, he actually come back from a factory. He's capable of doing the welding because for steel, the important thing is the welding part. And he helped me with this, but we cannot afford to order a new plate of steel. So actually we went to the junkyard to look for this piece of steel. And we did a, a timber mock-up on site, just in case that the, uh, they cut the steel wrongly. This is the one that's finished. We refer a lot to the local way of construction. In terms of details, this is the buffer zone that the, somehow the, the plan is a little bit different from the way they do buildings in the, in the, in the neighborhoods. So the Joseph Rock's house becomes uh, a, a facade of our complex. Okay, another project uh, I'm going to present is the, uh, in the same village, but outside the village. So it's, uh, the site is slightly different. But that one is the, in the neighborhood of the uh, local community, but this one is the, in, the, in this openness of the wilderness, which is very tough because you know, uh, if you want to stay in nature like this, it's tough to design something, right? Whatever you do is kind of a dwarf. So then I referred something to uh, the Chinese culture. So how to balance the natural power by doing something really smart, right? This is what we do with our architecture in the past. So you need to cope, you need to go along, breathe along with nature instead of standing without nature. So we don't look at buildings separately of, away from nature, but rather integrated with nature. So this is the solution. I try to balance up the strong young energy of the snow mountain by doing an in energy strong project by doing an uh, enclosure of courtyard, by extending the walls into nature uh, by a water body, so somehow you feel you are secured by a world within this bigger world of nature. And of course, all the materials comes from the environments, and the building, the code construction was totally built by the local people, the same village. This is the way you're approaching the building. When you surface, you see this uh, very low profile. Uh, I, I, I emphasize the horizontality because I want to present nature. It's like a French dish. You have a big plate. The dish is on top of it. And the sensitivity of the details actually comes from uh, uh, functional uh, requirements, not as a decoration. You see in this project, there's no decoration whatsoever. They're all functional. The idea is behind this uh, non-decorational uh, design is the, uh, the the beauty of nature is there. Whatever you do with your building can never compare. So you just stay calm, stay low profile. Yeah, the third project is the uh, the school bridge, uh, which won the Akahan Award. 
and is in the community uh, of remote village in Fujian province. And in this project, uh, I try to test some ideas from Chinese medical science, where we treat people as a as holistic system instead of uh, separate. So whatever wrong with your body is the whole system of your body. So what we do is we try to uh, make your body recover as a whole instead of separate entities. So in this case, uh, the community is declining because lack of public space and public activities. People used to live in the castle. So they have a communal center within the castle. And uh, after the turn of the last century, people start to move out of the, the castle. They stay in the small houses in the village. So after that, this is the weekend, and there's no public space anymore. So this is uh, before I did the construction. You can feel that the, uh, nobody cares about the environment anymore. So this is my solution. I want to insert an architecture program which has the multifunctional possibilities, and then provides public space on both sides and making a bridge. There's a creek actually here. And the two castles were rivals before, like Romeo and Juliet. And so the inspiration comes from why don't we connect them together with a program both symbolically and physically. Physically is a bridge. And programmatically is the school for children. The children is the linkage between the past and the future. So ideally, this one is like a, a multifunctional insertion, but identified as the uh, the right spot and the right energy to rejuvenate the whole community. And this is the mock-up I did. Here's the plan. It's a, it's a school, it's a library, it's a theater, it's a playground for the children, and uh, it's a bridge. And there's a shop underneath. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a one of the most uh, public space in this community. And uh, after the project is finished, it's widely published all over the world. And it become a tourist spot now. So every day, people come from all over the place to visit this building. And now the village people identify this village, this bridge, as their spirit center, not the castles anymore. That's a stage for the puppy show. Kids are very happy. They never saw outside world before. Now every day, the people from over the place, they communicate with the people. They become performers every now and then. It's like a, a suddenly a window opened up for them. Now the next project I'm going to present is a little library I did in the suburban area of Beijing, and in this case, I tried to test some ideas. Uh, how to uh, understand material in a different way, and how to understand uh, Chinese architecture, traditional architecture in a modern expression, and also how idea of technology, instead of technology as a separate entity, can be integrated with the design. This is the site. This is the village. This is the site before the construction. And you notice that the uh, is just along a water body, which I chose this water body intentionally to make the uh, 
integration of my understanding about technology in this case, to make the building ventilate itself without any help from air conditioning equipment because we don't have power supply. And this is a material I noticed uh, and impressed me so much when I visited the, the, the village. Uh, they are everywhere on the street in a courtyard and it's the material that they use to heat up the, uh, the house and also cooking. So I thought maybe this is uh, something I need to use to do my building. And this is the initial idea. So the, uh, the tweaks can be an uh, ideal material for me to put up a facade, not just a, as a decoration, but as a means to filter light through into a space. To do that, you need a layer of fix instead of just one layer, so you don't have strong shadows. And uh, after that, there's some other thinking coming over, along. So this is how the effects of the lighting through the tricks. Uh, it become ideal for people to calm down and to read. Uh, you notice that there's a height difference within the space. It's because to topographic reasons we sit the building actually onto this uh, mountain site. But another reason, the height of the building has a meaning why this height is because, I'll explain a little bit uh, later. Here's the plan. And this is the entrance, which is uh, intentionally designed as a very low. So the reason behind this is this. The temperature on the surface of water is much lower than higher plateau, right? So in summer, actually, uh, by doing this, I have a strong, not strong, but there's a current flow of wind through this tunnel. I'm oh, sorry. And then the location of the entrance here is try to bring the cold wind into the space by hot air trapped on the top of the building. So the double glazed roof is, is going to be very hot in summer, but I have openings on the sides. But on the other hand, the hot air is actually is good because the hot air will trap in, will absorb in the cool air from below. And then the openings located at the uh, seating area will you will feel breathing through your face level, which means uh, actually the temperature inside the, uh, the space is the same with uh, outside temperature under the shadow of the trees. But it feel cooler because they breathe This is the opening on the top in summer. And in winter, it's another way around. So the top double glazed space will trap in the heat to warm up the space within. So this is how I understand technology as a concept, as a philosophy, instead of a separate entity. And then another thinking behind this building is the uh, all the material are recyclable and uh, minimum uh, impact towards nature. So I didn't do anything on the surface of the tricks. So it, it's, it's part of nature, and hopefully in times to come, things will grow, and the birds can find their homes here as well. So the building process become a process of, of nature evolution as well. So it will change in terms of season, it will change. It will disappear, hopefully, in winter. Not hopefully, this is the, the real photo art, it's not photo montage.
And this is the understanding of Chinese architecture. They try to integrate with the landscape instead of standing alone, away from the landscape. So this is a, my understanding about the minimum impact towards nature as well. So you can notice the, uh, there's a straight line here. So the height of the building actually designed, it decided by the angle of your turn, you see this building in a very simple line. If this is higher or, or lower, you will see the tricks and lines. So it won't be as simple as I request. And then I designed a post-occupancy program for the project to sustain the, the, the project. That is people, uh, the visitors are free of, uh, of charge, but you are encouraged to donate minimum two books. And when you live, you can take one book from the collection away. So somehow the building become a platform for social exchange. The students actually join the process of, of measuring, design, supervising construction. And I'll be showing it. Uh, video before I go to the, the next project. The building receives average uh, 300 visitors in the weekend in summer. It's about uh, 80 kilometers away from the city. Tourists from France. And this lady come back from Los Angeles. For, for holiday, and she came to the, the, uh, the library every weekend. That's her father. So starting from uh, last November, since we opened the, uh, the library, we have now 7,000 books already, all by donations from visitors.
That's an interview uh, from the Beijing TV. That's me in my office. Okay, so next project is a, is a much larger scale. It's a city planning project in Sichuan province. And uh, so it's fresh for me. I've never, done, I've never designed a city before. So this is the first city project. And uh, it's, it's difficult for me and uh, also encouraging and also inspiring for me. It's from outside, right? <laughs> and, uh, here is a site. This is a site. So you know, the, uh, uh, in China, we are in a very fast track of urbanization. And uh, 1980s, we have about 20% of people living in the cities. Now we have about 50%. And now we still have about 400 million people to be urbanized in the next 20 years. And uh, we don't have that much land anymore. So the problem is that we, we have to identify what is the issue of the process of urbanization now. The problems uh, we need to solve is very critical now. I will show them images. This is China, and this is the, the land. 95% of the population lives. And also, within this one third of land, this is the only Arab land we have in China. Uh, you know, during the Cultural Revolution, uh, we send the young, fresh graduates to the countryside. Mao says it's got re-education, but actually, as a matter of fact, it's lack of employment. So the young people were sent to the countryside to survive on their own. And but then, we still have a countryside. We still have farmland. Imagine now, 80% of the population in China lives in the city. We don't have that much armland, run, uh, countryside anymore. In case the economy goes down, stops, goes down, one day it will happen. We don't have a countryside to go back. What happened? The Singapore, Singaporean can buy foods from anywhere. But if China want to buy foods from somewhere, it's a disaster of the world. This is China. It's during the, uh, uh, October holiday, and uh, can we imagine that China enjoys the same luxury of life style as Americans? That's the end of the world. It's not exaggeration, it's a fact. This is Shanghai. The Shanghainese are very proud to present to the world. Here we are a metropolitan, and uh, they have about, uh, they have built up actually for the last uh, decade, they built up more than 7,000 skyscrapers. And this is a, the Urban Design Museum. They showcase their achievement. But nobody knows that the, for scale, like Shanghai or Beijing, there's a tremendous risk. And there's a tremendous imbalance of development in China. The countryside are abandoned, but the living quality in a city is not better, actually. This is what you used to do for our construction. Very careful, chosen the site, and the way we do construction, and the timing. This is what we do now. We take away the trees and uh, 
plug in the, the buildings. And this is why the city is like a very inhuman in terms of scale, in terms of uh, many other issues. And uh, then you have to be very creative if you want to walk on grass in the city. So we need to consider what are the issues uh, we need to address in terms of uh, design or plan a uh, habitable city. Those are the points uh, I think we need to consider, the human scale, regional character, non-oppressive environment, linkage between past, now, and the future, sustainable social structure, easy transportation, children and elder friendly, high green ratio, and so on and so forth. All those are, are, you know, it's easy to talk about, but how to integrate those issues into design of a city is, is tremendous, tremendously difficult. But to summarize, we need to consider a balance between economy, society, and the environment. This is the photo of the site we are going to urbanize. It's beautiful uh, in, in whatever sense. And uh, this is a household. This is his farmland. So he grow potato, he sell potatoes. So the value of the land remain the same and this cannot sustain. So the idea to urbanize this area to make collective uh, power, so somehow extend the value of the land by doing uh, some uh, additional work, like uh, you grow potato, you can sell starch, that kind of uh, economic structure. And by collectively, you put those things together this is before, this is after. So you keep the same amount of farmland as it used to be, but replan the whole thing. Another issue I want to, I want to attack in this, in, this, in this design is about uh, how can we create an environment where you don't have to spend a lot of time and energy in going through a complicated transportation system like in a major city, it's like going through a maze. Can we do shortcut, for instance? And then the idea of cloud computing comes in that you do, uh, you share the resource. The problem of sustainability, I think what we're facing now, is how to sustain our society by using, consuming less energy. Then clear cut. Now how to do that? This is the pattern we adopted. The center service district is the cloud. And then these groups of individual community villages are connected to the cloud. And this is what we plan. So we have a, a infrastructure here. And all the communities can be just plugged on. And this is the cloud, which provides services for uh, the neighborhoods, and all within walking distance. This is about uh, one kilometer, so you can tell the distance. You don't need to drive a car. And we can replant the agricultural products collectively. And collective housing doesn't mean that you lose the quality of living in this case. We try to explore as much as possible of public space. And we remain some of the existing uh, cottages to promote tourism and engage with the high value return uh, agriculture product. And the idea is to give everybody a job so that the labor intensive is, the, is a must for Chinese community because we have a 1.4 billion uh, population. So the important thing, everybody has food instead of everybody has to own a car. And so that's by doing this. Thank you. So everybody, uh, the, the artists try to be engaged with the, uh, with the whole planning process to promote tourism, for instance. Uh, by combination of different uh, types of rice, we can create patterns somehow. So by 
from the airplane, actually you see uh, when you land to, before you land, land to the, uh, the nearby city, you can have the view of the really interesting images. So the idea is to increase the proportion of nature and reduce the artificial. So if we see urbanization process of producing carbon dioxide, and if we separate them, so what I call urbanization and the de-urbanization can produce more oxygen and reduce the emission of carbon. So this will be the future for urbanization in China. I hope so. And this is another project is the finish, but I don't have the, the finished photo yet. This is reality. I just show uh, from different parts of mine uh, what I do is the process of getting uh, what is the resource I have, what is the inspiration I can, I can achieve, and how I uh, create the form. It's a wetland, uh, wetland in Hangzhou, and this is uh, uh, the impression I have for that piece of land. This is the, the photo of this site. So I did a, a very sketchy conceptual drawings. This is the, the concept joints. And uh, it's like a, a water ink a painting. And so somehow the finished building is supposed to uh, distill the best quality of the site and present it back. So then uh, the building emerged, actually, from the site like this. It's like abstract painting using the Chinese watercolor painting. Uh, this is a, a conceptual design I did before for Singapore Zoo entrance. And this is a, the uh, uh, a design for the Zen uh, Hotel in Shaolin Temple. It's not built, it's a proposal. Okay, thank you so much. Thousand residents, farmers mostly. Uh, now, uh, the plant population is about uh, 150,000. So we have local people plus the uh, people, immigrants from nearby cities. And uh, the major uh, economic structure is the agriculture. At same uh, at the same time, we try to promote tourism and uh, agriculture-based industry. No other industry because we don't want pollutions because the major metropolitan city, Chengdu, is at the lower stream. We don't want the, uh, the pollution comes to big city. And so uh, that's basically what we do. So, so mostly residents and people working in nearby cities. And for the local people, they still do agriculture. And uh, the reason why uh, city people want to buy a residence here is that they can actually rent a piece of land which can be maintained, maintained, maintained by the local people who are farmers, so they do their own, the same job. So they, they get a double income through the rent, through the maintenance. So that's how, we, and, and city people, the reason why they want to buy the piece of land is because this, this residence is because you get fresh air and easy transportation system from, uh, from this area to nearby cities. And you have a piece of land to have your own agriculture product. No, no, it's uh, not yet at that stage. I think when we come to community design, individual house design, we'll come to that stage. At this stage, not yet. Yeah. Um, it's 
conspicuous in your work that a lot of architectural challenges in China has to do with it. There's so many square meters, so quickly between cities and your work. Yeah. For the most part, it's small scale, the countryside, or small towns. I'm curious, is that a choice that you've made? How do you see that relating to this larger problem? before. There are so many issues we can talk about for architecture practice in China. And you have to make a choice. What's your intention to do with your own architecture? So in what particular design? What message do you want to send? So in my case, I tried different sites. I initiated the project, designed it, get fundraising and get it built because I want to have 100% of right to say about what is the architecture supposed to be. And then so the information has to get out uh, much easily. Uh, because in China, it's, a, it's not really a mature society yet for architects to do creative job. You have to listen to your clients. You have to talk with the government and the contractors, you know, your collaborations with your the design institutions. So all these voices will try to pull you back. And then nothing much you can do to contribute to the world of architecture. And uh, that's the reason why I practice the way I do now. So it's a bit tough, but I enjoy the process of doing it. Yeah. Could you talk about uh, in the, uh, the, the construction as far as the human waste, water, conservation, recycling, and reuse, as far as sustainability, uh, the titles, uh, the agriculture, the consumption of food uh, into waste to turn it back? <laughs> The Ministry of Construction is trying to set up uh, a regulation standards uh, like what Leeds did in the United States. But not, it's not there yet. But we're trying to push uh, the practice to adopt those uh, policies. And uh, it's starting now. Yeah. So but in my. Urban yeah. Uh, urban agriculture, not yet. This is what I'm trying in, in this urban project, yeah. So I call it urbanization, not the uh, urban agriculture. Uh, thank you. Um, I found very interesting the, uh, the thinking and the logic behind the center periphery, yeah. how, how to try to find what is uh, intrinsic or unique about the periphery in order to make it a center. Uh, are, you, are you using that kind of way of approaching architecture? Are you trying to like teach that in Taichung University? Is like part of that? So how do you teach that? Uh, I think that's, this, that's the uh, uh, solution I got from the discussion of center and periphery. You have to do independent thinking based on the reality. So you try to address issues directly. So that's the part of the, uh, the pleasure I got from doing architecture. Each project is a learning process because I learn what's the problem of this site and what solution I can, I can, I can address those uh, uh, problems. So through the process, after finishing the design, I feel charged instead of feeling exhausted. I think that's the, uh, the way I teach my students that you do design. It has to be based on the dialogue between yourself and the reality instead of superimposed idea from your, your mind. Your mind is very empty, actually. You try to keep it as empty as possible. So somehow you have space to, to be creative. It's a long story. Uh, we have actually uh, uh, the same system as you have now, a studio-based uh, teaching uh, system. And uh, each professor has his, his own right to teach the way he tried to teach. And it's difficult to, to have a, a general framework for architecture education for me. I think uh, uh, education is just, a, I mean, the university is just a small part of exercise you can learn architecture. It's, uh, it's getting more and more uh, difficult because the definition of architecture now is so different from 20 years ago, from 50 years ago. It's more about integration of so many subjects together. It's, it's again the time now. Because uh, if we talk about first ecology as human beings still part of nature, second ecology as we have been practicing for the last 5,000 years, try to distinguish ourselves in interior space with outer space. But now I think it's, if we talk about sustainability, it's a time 
to go to the third ecology where human beings coexist with nature uh, intelligently. That's how I uh, did my project with the, with the library. So this kind of a, a thing become more and more complicated because there's so many knowledge there you try to retrieve. That's why architecture education is probably is just, the, it's just the base. And uh, it's almost impossible for, for students freshly graduate from school that, okay, I'm ready for the society. I think it's not impossible not anymore. So uh, in our school, uh, I don't know how to put it in simple words. Uh, I don't think we have a yet clear dis uh, distinguished structure in teaching in that kind of domain yet. But we try to uh, set up a base in our undergraduate program and in our postgraduate program is more into the uh, uh, conceptual uh, level, how you, you, you try to give more thought behind the form. Where at undergraduate program, you try to be very fundamental in understanding how architecture can be built in technonic terms. I don't know if it's, it's difficult to answer your question because the, uh, it's complicated, yeah.